start recording now. Uh, we also have um, other AI working. I, I think you can see on, on the top of the Zoom screen, if you would like to have um, uh, live captions of all of us talking, uh, you click there and then you can, you can check the transcript. Uh, sometimes with the accents and stuff, sometimes that helps. Um, and that also makes it easier for us to transcribe or put um, correct the, trans the captions in the YouTube videos afterwards. All right, Lia, um, Lia, no, uh, Laura, you okay? Yes, yes, happy to co-host the call with you, Paz. Fantastic, okay. So people, we have, I'm gonna just post a link to the pad there. Um, use it if you can post questions or when we are in the breakout rooms, you can uh, make, uh, write the comments or the bullet points of your discussion there if you want, but more on that later on. So. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, Yo is not here today. She's very busy, but I'm going to try to replace her as, you know, I, I think it's difficult because she's so charismatic, but I'll do my best. Um, so let's start with the, the usual things. Um, the first one is a reminder of the Code of Conduct and the Community Participation Guidelines. You can see the, that in line 45 in the pad. And so that includes being respectful and being nice to each other. And um, you know, if, if you experience any, any sort of problem or if you want to discuss the situation with us, uh, send us an email to keep at openlifesize.org or to any of us um, <clears throat> directly. Uh, also, you can uh, let us know, let us know uh, via Slack. Um, uh, I already told you about, about order AI. So it's a transcript service and you can click in live, live on order AI and you can um, access that, uh, the captions, the live captions and follow, follow along the call if you cannot hear well or if your mic is broken or you know anything happens. Um, only if you just need it because of our accents and stuff. Very important for now, I'm gonna check uh, who, like, yeah. So please write an S or a W in front of your name uh, in Zoom so we know uh, which uh, breaker room you want. If you want a written, written breaker room, just to write with people and not to talk, not to speak, then write a W. If you want to be in a spoken breaker room, break room um, write an S in front of your name. So in the case of Kedmalia, okay. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that well, please do so. Ahian or I'm sorry about the pronunciation, please correct me. <laughs> and I there are a few others that do not have any 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 um letter in front, including myself. Uh, but I'm not gonna go to the breaker rooms. So <laughs> I'm not gonna put that on. Um so yes. Okay, so uh what else? Mm -hmm. That's it. All right, we're gonna have a first um, presenter. I think it's the first time he joined us. Uh, am I wrong? Well, I done at least the first time in my, yeah, it is the first time. So welcome to the OLS community and to this cohort and to this call. We're really looking forward um, to hear about your presentation. I know very little about the subject, close to nothing. So, um, uh, but I'm gonna do my best to, you know, uh, learn as much as possible. So hopefully I'm not the only one in this situation here. And um, and then we're gonna go with Olaitan first, and then with Leah Vasser. Um, uh, Olaitan, your last name is how do I pronounce it? Awe? Awe? Awe. Awe. All right. And then we're gonna have Leah, and then Yanina. Yanina is from Argentina, from the same country. I mean, so but we're not close by. Anyways, um. Right. Okay. I think you can share your screen. You already did it all in time. You have 10 minutes. Um, if you want, we can let you know two minutes before 10 minutes, if you want. If not needed, I mean, you can tell us. We can do that for you. That That's helpful for me, at least when I present. Um, and then we have five minutes for questions. And yeah, and please, any questions or comments, 
use the pad, the chat, or during the five minutes, um, you can speak as well and, and let us know here. So let's go. All right. Thank you very much for the starting um, period for this session. So my name is Olai Tawe. And currently, I'm the training officer for the African Society for Bioinformatics and Computational Biology, that's ASBCB for short. And basically, in that role, I do have the capacity of leading workshops and webinars and organizing codathons, where we bring together live scientists, mostly from Africa, who work on interesting projects, biomedical science related projects. And I'm going to get into some of the specifics later on in my talk here. Uh, the other thing I would like to highlight about myself is that I do have research interests that primarily focuses on the use of computational biology techniques to make sense of omic sequences. So we, most of the time, just leverage on public data sets and then develop tools, pipelines, workflows, and just write code to analyze those data sets. And the goal is just to understand the molecular mechanisms driving disease and health. And I do that as part of me being the training officer for the ASBC, and I'll get more into that. So when I talk more about some things around reproducible code. I, would, I might be a little bit biased because I do more of bioinformatics and any other type of programming. So, but I would try my best to also say things that other people that are not necessarily core bioinformatics people can relate to. So I do have my email right there in case anyone wants to reach out to me. And then even though I'm not that active on Twitter, but that's my Twitter handle also. And I've shared this slide with Camille Gonzalez in case anyone needs it. So I'm going to get straight into it. So what is reproducible code? So code is reproducible if the result of analysis does not depend on the computational environment in which data processing and analysis originally took place. Another way to look at it is that the workflow that that code is written for will produce the same results when you rerun that workflow in the same environment or on a different computing platform. So computing platforms here might mean in the cloud, maybe GCP or you know, Google um, you know, cloud or AWS or maybe in your Cluster, maybe your cluster uses Slurm, SGE, and the likes, or even on your laptop, it produces the same result. That's the meaning of reproducible. So somebody can get the same result you got on their own end by running your code. So I'm going to go to the next slide. Now, the general framework for reproducible code is you collect data. That's more like the first step of it. Then you develop the pipeline or write the codes or scripts, and then you generate some outputs from the pipeline, and then you interpret the output. So this is just a, more of a framework for reproducible code, just in my own definition of it. In the context of genomics, which is something I relate more to, like I said earlier, you collect data, biomedical data or omic sequences. And you could collect those from any of the repositories that are public, for instance. And then you develop the pipeline or codes that you can use to analyze those sequences. Those sequences could be RNA transcripts, could be whole genome sequences, could be whole exomes or any kind of sequences. Your pipeline will generate some outputs, which some people will call results. And then the next thing is just to interpret that output or results in order to advance our understanding of the biology and health, basically. So I have come up with a few 
list of steps that somebody that wants to write code that is reproducible can actually follow, especially in the context of the life sciences. And I'm assuming that you're using a repository which is findable, like GitHub, which is why I have that here on this slide. My recommendation is to break down the directories that you are going to be starting with into the first eight items on this list. So you are going to have a directory for data. You have one directory for accessions. So accession is just the identifier for your, your sequences. It could be something that identifies a human you know, um, sample that you're working with, for instance, and you could be working on maybe 100 human samples in your analysis, right? So you have a directory for data, a directory for accessions, a directory for figures that your pipeline potentially will produce. You have a directory for scripts. That's what brings us here, right? You're writing maybe bash scripts or Python or whatever kind of language or Nextflow, right? You just have a directory where you're putting those scripts. You have a directory for documents. It might be documents relating to uh, maybe papers that somebody that wants to understand the work might read or any kind of documents with regard to the project. You have a directory for outputs, which is going to be the output of your pipeline, intermediary results and things like that. It might be quality control results from your, where you're trying to do quality control on these sequences. You have a directory for workflow. The workflow in this step means step-by-step -step sequence of tasks that you perform in your analysis. Maybe step one is download the sequences. So you have a text file where you just put all your steps. Step one, download the sequences. Step two, uh, perform quality control. Maybe step three, download the reference genome or something like that. Step four, align your sequences to the reference. You just have, I recommend that people follow this because it helps to know what you're doing first and then next and then next and then next. Just something that enables reproducibility generally. And then you have a directory for notebooks for demonstration. So if you're doing a Jupyter notebook or R Markdown or something like you have a directory where you just put those things, somebody can test your pipeline, you know, because they have some Markdown document that you follow. Then you have at least a file for the license and I recommend open license. Most times when I organize codathons, we just use MIT um, license for the GitHub um, repositories. And then you have a markdown document for README that tells somebody who comes to the repository, what's the motivation for this work? You know, just the background, why are you trying to solve the problem that you identified, how to install the tools that you've built and some other things. And if people worked on it, you, they deserve credits. You list the team members at the bottom of the readme.md document. There are workflow management systems that help people to build reproducible code in, especially in bioinformatics, right? So the one that I advocate for is called Nextflow. And it has benefits like interoperability, component reuse, reentrancy. You can parallelize the operations. It allows the use of containers like Docker or Singularity. And then of course it's reproducible. So somebody will get the same result if they run their workflow on a different environment. There are other workflow management systems people use in writing reproducible code like SnakeMake, which is more of a Python type of workflow management system. There's Cromwell, there is Galaxy. And then if you are writing, building pipelines, but you are not using workflow management systems like Nextflow, you could use any language that you're comfortable with, depending on your application and what you're comfortable with. So it could be a language like Bash or Python or Perl or Java, C and C++. The main thing is automate the pipeline, avoid typing things in the terminal. Just put most of the commands in the script that you use in running that pipeline. That's the automation part of it. And then the research standard that I do recommend is open science because it enables um, improves accessibility to, you know, um, scientific work and it's more quality and it improves the efficiency of science. So the data, the pipeline, the code should be open as much as possible. And then the articles that come from the project should also be open access articles. I know that it could be expensive, but then it lets people access that article and they could read it when it's open access. And then the research data, 
should and code and pipeline should be fair, meaning that it's findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, and document as much as possible. Add comments to your code so that someone looking at the code could read it and understand. Even the future you would understand the code better because of the comments. There are some life science project categories that people might be interested in. So I just listed some of them here, but I can't go through the list because of time. So it could range from transcriptomics, metagenomics, genomic variation, pipeline building, you know, oncology and stuff like that. So do you want to start to write reproducible code? You can start practicing by using public data sets from the sequence rate archive or gene expression omnibus or ENA, RefSeq, GenBank, all these are public repositories where you could get sequences to play with. And then you could check out announcements that we do have, asvcb.org forward slash events for Codathon announcements. So I would like to acknowledge some of the people that support me in ESVCB, like Marion, Yamari, Nohaila, and AG, and also uh, from the ODSS and the NIH NCBA. And that's it. Thank you very much. And here's my email. Is anyone wants to reach out to me? Thank you. Um, let's use the emojis for for a round of applause, people, please. Um, and we have time for questions, so please don't be shy. You can also write them in the chat or just speak without showing your face if you prefer. Um, and you can also save them for for later. But I would advise if you have specific questions. Um, oh, all right, done. Where, what, what city are you based? I forgot. I'm, I'm currently based in New Britain, Connecticut. Ah, okay. Yeah. Do we have someone based there? I don't think so. <laughs> um, I just wanted to see if there was someone living close to you. Um, right. Lauda, do you want to keep pushing people for questions or <laughs> move to the next? Uh, presentation. Sure. If anyone has a question, please pop them on the chat. I am closely looking at the etherpad and no questions yet for Olighton. <clears throat> so I'm encouraging anyone who has any questions, please uh, put them on the etherpad or on the chat and we'll redirect them to Olighton to answer them. I will also ask people to write their names in the pad if you want, like in the inline, let me see, um, 25. Let us know who is there and yeah. Uh, okay, if you think of any, any other questions you can, we can do that later as well uh, because we're good on time. And Laura. I can, I can see someone is uh, typing a question on the etherpad, so let's just give them uh, a second to finish that. But uh, Richard on the chat asks, would you help us uh, talk about advantages of using reproducible code? All right. All right, good. I could talk about that. Thanks for um, that question. So one of the main advantages of using reproducible code, especially if it's in science, is that it strengthens the potential article or publication that comes from that work or the manuscript that you're actually trying to draft from that project. A lot of times when you make your submission to a peer review journal, reviewers vary for sure in terms of the rigor they apply to when they review an article, but a lot of times some reviewers are concerned about how reproducible the work is because it's science. So if the work is not reproducible, what is the proof that the authors are not just making up things, you know, but because it's science, they want to sometimes check that what you're claiming is true. But if your code is reproducible, you have nothing to fear because as part of your submission, maybe you also give them the uh, the the URL where you have where you've deposited your code and things like that. When you when the reviewer runs the code, they get the same results that you have in the results section. So there is no further argument about it. So that's at least one benefit of it. Another reason why it's important or a benefit of writing reproducible code is that you might be actually collaborating with people. Okay, 
there might be parts of the project where your collaborators need to implement, but they might need to take off from somewhere where you have stopped. If your code is reproducible, then it's easy to actually get that work done. Why? Because your collaborator can run the code on their own end, even in a different environment if possible, get the results that they need to then continue with their own part of the project. So collaboration is also made possible because of reproducible, reproducibility. And there's a bunch of benefits for it. The overall is the strength and the validity of any work is in its reproducible reproducibility. So it's good to write reproducible code. Uh, thank you, Olighton. Uh, on line 65 on the etherpad, uh, someone asks, omics is maybe ahead of many fields in reproducibility. How can we encourage co-authors to work e.g. on GitHub for collaborative articles when many prefer to share Word documents by email? So that's a very good point that you have made. Um, people do prefer to share documents by email, but I think an easy way to get started with collaboration, even from the document perspective, is to actually use Google Doc, for instance, or Google Sheets. So instead of just having a single file on your laptop or you're editing stuff, and then you're done, then you email it to somebody, it's actually better to do the, uh, the version where you actually get the thing on Google Doc. So you're collaborating with your collaborators on Google Doc for the documents. If people are actually writing up their manuscript and things like that, which is something that I encourage a lot. So you give people who are co-authors access to the Google Doc, and then maybe somebody is writing the introduction part of the manuscript, somebody is writing the methods or the results or discussion or any other part of it. Everybody has access to a central document. In fact, I try to tell people that if you ever have a reason to do on your own laptop some of the, the work, as much as possible, make sure that you update the Google Doc so that other people can take on from there or can know where we are generally. So that's one method of it. Uh, and that doesn't really even have to do with omics or not. For the GitHub point, I think one thing that we need to get into is to probably uh, emphasize more on people uh, being GitHub savvy, right? So that people can actually do their work, mostly build pipelines and things like that, and just push stuff to GitHub. It's just a few of the GitHub commands that people need generally to actually get started. Of course, when you now start getting more experience with collaboration, there can be much more things you're doing, you know, pull requests and merging and things like that. But just for starting, you can actually just learn a few basics of Git and GitHub and then just start collaboration. But it's something that you do, you know, by practicing. So it's, I would recommend people just start doing it. Don't wait till I want to go for this webinar or this one or whatever. Just start, you know, look for some video on YouTube about how to use Git and GitHub. And then that should get you started and just start doing it immediately with your current projects. Instead of procrastinating that, yeah, I'll get into all this GitHub thing sometime next year or next month or whatever. Just immediately get started. And that's how to do it. Yeah. Thank you, Olaidan. And I have a question. Um, do you do you make a difference or do you use the, the word reproducible and replicable? Are, are the same for you? Do you use both or do you make a difference between the two, replicable and reproducible? I'm asking because someone asked a friend, I mean, not just someone, someone who was reviewing his paper said, oh, you shouldn't use the word replicable and reproducible in the same ways. So I just, I'm just curious to see if you actually use both words or just only reproducible. I think reproducible is broader than just replicable because I could replicate the results by just running the analysis again on your own laptop, the one you used, for instance, if you use the laptop or on your cluster, if that's what you use, your own specific cluster. But then if it's reproducible, it actually is broader because that means 
I don't have to rerun that analysis on your own environment. I could rerun it on my own environment, which doesn't have to be even the type of environment to use, right? If you use a cluster that uses Slurm as the job scheduler, I could use a different job scheduler on the cluster that I have, maybe Stork or PBS and things like that. And I still get the result. I could actually even run the analysis, for instance, on Google Cloud, get the result, run it on Amazon Web Services, get the result. So reproducible is broader because it covers, it's agnostic of the computing environment. So I would say reproducibility is bigger than just replicability, which, you know, is easy. Just redo whatever you did in your own same situation. That's very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> to you now. Thank you, Lighten, for the wonderful presentation on writing reproducible code. In case anyone has any further questions, please pop them on the etherpad from line 65 or line 64 where it says questions. Uh, you can add a bullet point from there. Uh, we'll just move on to our next speaker now. Uh, and our next speaker will be Lea. Her information is on the etherpad from uh, line 71. And I'll just let Leah introduce herself. Sounds great, thank you. Um, give me a moment here to share my screen. Oh. Okay, can someone give me a thumbs up that you actually see the PyOpenSci slide? Thank you. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Leah Wasser. I am the executive director and founder of PyOpenSci. A little bit about me. Um, I am a remote sensing ecologist by training, so I've done a lot of stuff with like spatial data and looking at forest health um, through my degree. And then I decided that I actually really like helping scientists do their science a lot more than doing my own science. And so I spent the past, say, 20 years teaching um, what I now call earth and environmental data science. So really focused on using data to do science. And as a side note, when I was getting my PhD, which wasn't all that long ago, I had to constantly defend why using someone else's data, so data from like satellites and such, was actually science because I wasn't out just doing field work. I was using this like other types of data and I was coding and, and coming from a traditional ecology program that was like really different. So it's pretty cool to be here now with all of this tech and everyone embracing data as being kind of the next wave of what's driving science. So a little bit about PyOpenSci, we are building diverse community around the scientific open source software that's driving open science. And so these are tools that we're all using in our code to do open science. And so that is the software that we're supporting. And we do that through peer review, training, and mentorship. A little bit about our community. So we have a community-driven organization and our board chair is Tracy Teal, who is uh, or who used to lead the Carpentries for many years. So many of you might be familiar with all of the amazing work the Carpentries has and is still doing. And if anyone has questions, I'm not gonna talk about peer review a lot today, but we do have a software peer review process for scientific tools. So if you're developing tools that you think have a application that is beyond just the work that you yourself are doing and you plan to maintain them for a couple of years, um, we are a sister organization to our OpenSci that also has a peer review process. And so I'd love to answer any questions if you have questions about peer review and what that means for software. Now, what I'm gonna talk about today in the next few minutes is just a little bit about what is open source and how it's really driving open science. And then I'm gonna spend the last couple of minutes talking about how there's this spectrum where sometimes it seems like software is this thing out to the right that, you know, no one, it's not me, I'm, I'm not a software developer, I am not creating software, and so I, should, I don't have to think about software, but I'm going to show you how what I think is a spectrum of scripts to software and how you're probably somewhere along those spectrum lines, and in fact, that's how I got into software myself, so I'll wrap up with that quick discussion. 
So open source software is super valuable. We're talking about billions to trillions of dollars a year. Um, and this is just in companies in tech that is um, driving open source. And it's said that 80 to 90% of companies are using open source as the foundation for their business. And I would say that's probably a lot higher than that number. And it's probably even higher in the science industry specifically. Open source software is actually not just about software. It's really about people that value free open tools. And so that community piece of open source is really important for anyone to think about when you're talking about open source. And those people are putting a huge amount of effort into every tool. So if you are using R, if you are using Python, if you are using matplotlib to plot things or ggplot in the R side of things, each one of those tools has a group of people behind it. Sometimes it's just one, sometimes it's a whole group of people, especially for things like Python and R that are working on those tools for all of us to use. Every time you install one of those tools, I want you to think about that because it's a huge lift. And I think all of us in this kind of open science space know that coding is also kind of hard and tricky to do. So there's a lot of effort that goes into these tools that we're all using every day. And open source software is so valuable, especially when you're talking about reproducibility and open science, because it allows anyone to install these tools and start learning them and start using them. And you can use them anywhere without having to worry about licenses and fees. And so that is really why we can do open science that is enabling and empowering us to be able to do open science. Now that spectrum that I referred to before of scripts to software, it's really an interesting thing to think about because I think most of us, when we're learning how to code, when we're learning how to work with data, we start kind of over here on the left of my screen where it says scripts. And so that's where you're starting to um, create a workflow and you're just doing the things that you need to do in a workflow and getting them done. And I'll show you an example of that in just a moment. And then on the right side of the spectrum, we have software. And those are the things that like anyone can install and use. They're normally generalized. So they're not just for a specific workflow. They're something that lots of people can use. Maybe that lots of people is just the people in your lab, not just you. Maybe that is you and your future self. Um, and so there's lots of different kind of iterations around going from scripts to software. And let's let's look at that, but I want to say one more thing before I look at we look at that. And that is that I want to acknowledge that programming is hard, right? And I'm not saying it's hard as in you all can't do it, we can't do it. Like I'm a self-taught programmer. I'm just saying that there's a steep learning curve and it takes a lot of time. So what can be really hard when you're thinking about your science and you want to create this workflow and you just want to get it done is that can you think about your future self and can your future self update that code when that paper review comes back in, or maybe you need to extend your analysis. It's hard to do that when you're actually also fighting with, gosh, I just need to open this file and like plot and look at the data and I've got 10 cleaning steps to figure out along the way. So I just want to acknowledge that this is this is a hard process. But let's think about that process and kind of break it down. So here's some pseudocode. We're not going to worry about any actual code here, but rather just some steps. So imagine you have some data files to open. It's precipitation or rainfall data, and you have 12 files, one month of data in each file. So you have 12 files total. And if you're scripting, you might like figure out how to open the file and clean the data and convert whatever you need to convert and then plot the data. And so once you figure that out for one file, you're like, great. I can just copy and paste that code for the second file and the third file and just change the path to the file name and 12 files are processed and it's quick and it's done. But that's what I like to call copy pasta. So when you're copying and pasting and you're changing one thing and that can be really difficult, it can be fast to get started, but it can be difficult when your future self goes back and needs to update that processing step so your paper review comes back. Now you have to update, update every single section of the code. That's a lot of maintenance work. And then what if you needed to expand your workflow? Now you've got multiple sites, multiple years. You're going to be copying and pasting for days to get all of that code correct. And you're likely to make mistakes because as humans, we make mistakes. 
So now you could start to think about, or you could start to think about this from the very beginning of your workflow, the kind of pseudo code of like, what are the main things that I need to do? And could I start to modularize that code? And that idea of modularizing code is kind of the first step. It's like the gateway drug towards software, right? Towards making something that other people can use and reuse. And so here's an example, like we could start to create functions to do some of those steps. And now our script becomes a lot smaller in terms of lines of code, easier to maintain. And if I need to update processing steps, I'm updating one function instead of the same thing copied 12, 24, 36, however many times it's copied. Now, again, the next step of this kind of what I like call the gateway drug is what if you want to share that workflow with your colleagues? Now you might want something that's installable into an environment. And it's not really that huge of a leap to go from, I'm going to create some functions and classes or whatever my code structure is to, boy, I'm going to create something that I can install into environment. And also my colleague can install into an environment and we can all use and reuse those same shared functions, methods, whatever the case may be. So now your code that started as a script turns into something that you can import at the top of the script that anyone else could import that exact same set of functions, and then they could begin processing their data. Of course, there's probably some for loops or iteration that would be, ha that be happening in this example, but this is just this idea of individual use and starting to think about code all the way up to open source software, which is the thing that lots of people can use, hundreds to thousands to millions if you're a package like NumPy or a tool like Python. And so I just wanted to think about, get you to think about the fact that your code is along that spectrum that you're writing. And open source software is this thing that's driving everything that we do. So it's really important to kind of think about this, but also think hard when you start to write your code in terms of, gosh, could I make this a little bit easier for my future self? And software might be in your future, that's how I ended up here, actually, believe it or not. So takeaways from today, your code is within the spectrum of script to software. If you can, think before you start to script and write things out in plain old English, think about pseudocode and think about modularization because your future self will really appreciate it, but your lab mates and others in your field might also appreciate it as well. Um, and then just know that open source software is really about community and people that really deeply care about the fact that we can all use their tools and we don't have to pay for them and we can make our science open and accessible because of that. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. Um, my contact information is in the lower um, or my email is in the lower left hand side of the screen. Hi, OpenSci. Um, Twitter, we're on Twitter, we're on Mastodon. We have a discourse if you have questions about kind of working on your code and turning it into a package, we can ask answer questions. We also have a peer review process. If anyone's interested in getting involved, you can sign up to be a reviewer or you can submit a package to review. So I am open to answering any questions that you have. And thank you so much for inviting me to share today on this call. Thank you, Leah. Um, applause, applause, uh, applause uh, first, or other emojis like a heart or whatever. Thank you so much, uh, Leah. That was very, very clear as well. And yeah, and I, I have one first question before I'm sure some people are, think, are thinking of, of a few, but I have the first. Um, what would you, or some of the tips or things that as a, as a self taught programmer like you, uh, what ideas do you have for people who work alone, mostly alone or remotely with other people, but uh, who do not have like coding buddies or <laughs> friends um, or just people that have a lot of trouble kind of doing things or motivating themselves to get into this? Um, what would you advise? What would you what what advice do you have for that that type of people? Uh, yeah, I, that's such a good question. And I I really think that the biggest thing in that space that will really jumpstart is to find a community or find some group so that you're not so alone. And I'll give you an example of this. Like I started out 
completely on my own. I was just learning like the hard way how to code. And I had this huge amount of data and I had some friends that um, were using uh, were coding and they kind of got me started. And I was like, wow, they just did something that it would take me like three weeks to figure out. And they just coded this thing up and did it in like an hour and it processed all of my data. And I was like mind blown by that power. So those colleagues were kind of, that was my gateway drug into data science. Um, but the thing that really pushed me into the community and, and took me to where I am here today was finding out about the Carpentries. And the reason why was because it wasn't actually the training. I've actually never done a car, I've taught Carpentries training. I've never actually done one, done a class. But the thing for me there was having people that were doing the same type of work and they were doing data science that I could ask questions. I could ask questions about Git. I could ask questions about GitHub and like making those friends and colleagues. And in fact, that's how I wrote my first R package was someone was like, wow, this is like really useful. You should just turn this into a package. And I'm like, I'm not a software engineer. Like I can't do that. And they were like, nope, you totally can. <laughs> and this is how. And so I know it's really difficult, but I do truly believe that having community is important. And even today, I have colleagues that are developers that know way more than I do. And when I get stuck with a crazy Git issue or something that's just like, I'm so frustrated, even if I could spend hours figuring it out, knowing that I have people, I can just ask a question and at least they can say, hey, I've been there too. I've had that same challenge. I feel like that's a game changer for people. So if there's one thing that you can do, I would say like try to find a community, whether it's a local meetup, whether it's an online community that you can become a part of. So you feel like you're not alone when you get stuck. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Hey, any other questions, people? Here's one. Laura, do you want to? Yeah. yeah, I can probably ask it on the, using voice, but I'm honestly, I don't know if this is within your alley, Leah, but I'm going to ask it anyway in case you have any thoughts. I'm honestly curious uh, about how code is transformed into actual product. For example, if I've written code that probably transforms, uh, like how a thermometer works. So how, how, how is that code put into an actual <laughs> product? That, that not in the form of packages, but like something that actually works. I don't know if my question makes sense. Are you, I'm not sure. So not a package, not something that's installed, but I guess I'm not sure what the product, do you mean like, like added to a sensor kind of thing? Yeah. Like that kind yeah. of, okay. And I'm probably, I'm definitely not the right, I'm not an engineer, <laughs> um, but I would just imagine maybe someone else is that there's that those products have some kind of chips that get that are able to install things. Like I know there's micro Python now for small like chip kind of instances of tools and you can install things into micro Python. And so I would imagine that it's like very similar to that where there's some kind of um, chip processor that's much smaller than our computers that things get installed into. But I am, I am guessing based on my knowledge, my limited knowledge of micro Python. So maybe someone else can answer that better than me. <laughs> Okay, that's that. That makes sense. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, you can pop them on the chat or on the Etherpad line ninety one. There's one that's coming on the chat. Yeah. Yeah, Alan. Um, do you wanna um say that I'll read the question that Nikki posted in the chat? That is better for the transcription later on for the uploading. Yeah. Um, let's see. So the question is um being part of a community also helps us in how to frame questions. Do you think that might change as people start to rely on LLMs for their initial questions? I think that's a really, really good question. Um, especially I just came from PyCon and it was like LLMs for days, like the whole vendor hall was companies with using LLMs. Um, so LLMs being large language models. So we're talking about like chat GPT, open AI stuff, BARD, um, the bank, there's all these different LLMs now. 
Um, so yeah, I think I think that there's definitely going to be some things that change. And I this know that like we're in opinion territory. Like so you're hearing my opinion on this. Um, I think that there's a couple of really interesting things with LLMs. One is kind of in the same way, like learning how to ask the right questions. Like if you ask a question on Stack Overflow, terrible example, but like people will get kind of dinged if their question isn't specific enough. You aren't gonna get dinged from chat GPT, but if you don't ask specific enough, specific enough questions, that's definitely gonna be something where, you know, uh, there's gonna be a learning curve there where you might not get the answer the right answer at the beginning. And so you might still need community. Um, the other thing that I think in terms of LLMs is that frankly, if you've tried using them for code, like half the time it's not, doesn't run or it's not right. And so there's still a level of technical knowledge that I think this might change, but like right now you still have to have some level of technical knowledge to see like, oh, this returned, but it didn't quite like do things the right way or the code doesn't quite run. And so you're going to still end up with a situation where if you're especially newer, I think having people around might help, but I don't know, you know, I don't know where this landscape is going to go with LLMs. There's YouTube videos for days now on how to ask questions and how to start learning Python using chat GPT. So I'm just, you know, Nikki, I'm just kind of guessing as to where we might be going in that space. And I think at least for the near term, we're still going to need each other to kind of figure things out because they're not going to always give you the right answer. And how do you know if you're, especially if you're a beginner, how do you know that it's feeding you, you know, not the right information? So that's just my two cents. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you, everyone. And I do have a question. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, thanks. So when Leah talked about peer review, I'm curious if that means code review or peer review of manuscripts. Ah, yes, yeah, software, definitely code. So we oh. review, yeah, we review, um, and 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 Yanni will talk about our open sci. I, I don't want to speak for what you're gonna say, Yanni, but we're sister organizations. So we both review um our open sci R packages. So software and PyOpenSci is Py packages, Python packages. And you know, there's some text because there's documentation and and thinking about usability and that kind of thing, but we're also reviewing the actual code um, and usability of the software. Great question. Well, let's see if there's another one in the in the pad. No. So we can go and well, thank you again, both the speakers so far and Leah and Olaitan and and all of you for being here and, and asking questions and being present, even if you're not showing your faces. Um, we have to do a call one day, not record it, because I want to see people's faces at some point. Um, I know some of you, but I haven't seen so anyway. Um, okay, so we're gonna go with Janina Bellini. Um, and she can introduce herself. Uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, let me try to share my screen. Let me know if you are seeing my slides. Yes, okay, thank you. I saw some heads doing like this, so thank you for that. Okay, we'll open the chat. So um, thank you for the invitation for being here today and, and, and try to share something about programming or coding for, for science. Um, my name is Shani. I live in Argentina in South America. And since June last year, I'm the community manager of our open site. And I was a researcher in the agricultural sector for 24 years before to have this role. And I'm part of several community of practice. Some um, already mentioned like carpentries, uh, like our ladies, uh, like Asir, like Mayar, and a lot of R's in my life because it's the languages that I really enjoy to, to call. 
So a lot of my examples today is going to have um, our examples. So the, the idea that, that I want to share with you today is uh, to talk about what is good code when you code for anything, not only for doing science, but for, for, for anything that you try to program in. Um, I like this phrase for Hadley Wickham uh, that say the only way to write good code is to write a ton of shitty code first. And you don't should feel shame about your bad code because that stops you from getting to good code. And this has to do with ask question, as Alia to say, and to share what you are doing to get feedback. I know that that can be more hard for some people than from another, but as Leah just say, if you found a good community, you will be able to do questions and to share without any concern about what people will say to you, but knowing that these people in this community will help you to improve and to learn. There are several practices and guidelines to write good code. And I will talk about two today, styling and testing as Paz um, asked me to, to do. So at our open site, we also do a stat software review. And this software review has as a goal to improve uh, your software to do science. So this, this uh, review is not adversarial, it's constructive. It's transparent. Everything is in GitHub. You can see all the discussion of the reviewers and the editor with the authors. And we don't have rejection. So if you send your package to us and we say, yes, we can review, we are going to go through with you all the path until you can fix the things that need to be fixed and the package is ready to become part of our suite. With this process, we help to disseminate best practices to develop software and we build community. And everything that I will mention today and with a lot of more details uh, are in our, our open site packages, development, maintenance and peer review book that you have uh, the link on this on this slide. So let's start with styling, coding styling. And, and what is that? Um, uh, how many of you are uh, know what is code smells? Do you know about this this uh, term? Write on the chat. Just tell me yes, no, maybe I don't know. I got a yes, no, not me. Yes, okay, good. Code smell is a term that was coined in the nineties, but Fowler and that says that it's an structure in the code that just suggest refactoring. And you can say, oh, come on, Shani, that is not clear. What refactoring is? OK, refactoring is, is to modify the code to make it easy to understand and modify without changing the behavior. And Leah gives some examples. She say, OK, I have this script, and then I be I transform this script in some functions, and then I take these functions and made a package. That is refactoring. Uh, you know, I give a talk uh, a, a couple of weeks ago in CSVConf, and I did an R code, and I have 13 pieces of code that the only thing that changed is the path to access some files and some, <laughs> and some tags that I need to read. That code is screaming, Shani, please become in a function with this. So that is refactoring, to take our code and make it better to understand and to modify. And code smells um, are not good for our code um, because create cognitive load. It is usually code that is hard to read, hard to follow, and it is more likely to contain errors. So we are going to try to avoid code smells. Fowler has a lot of a list uh, of what kind of code smells can have our code. I'm only going to talk about um, code smell that is related with the styling of the code. Why the code smell create cognitive load? Because it is more hard to read. Uh, so we, we as human beings has a short uh, memory uh, to work, a, a memory, a, 
a capacity to process in our memory, and that is going to restrain how much we can read and understand of a code or, or any other material. So we're going to focus on how to naming things. Put names to things is a really hard task. This code smell is called linguistic anti-pattern. And for example, it is when the code do something different that the names involved suggest. What? For example, if I have a variable that the name is is valid and contains an integer, that is a linguistic anti-pattern because of with that name, I will expect that the variable is a Boolean, for example. I will expect a true or false. I will not expect a number. So th this is the kind of things that uh, our code, we have this linguistic anti-pattern smell. So we have several tools to, to try to avoid this. And in the tidyverse style guide, uh, one of the things that say is that variable and functions name should use only lowercase letters, numbers, and underscore. And the Python one says that you use camel case, for example, not a snake case like the tidyverse uh, says. And how do you choose? Well, studies say that camel case is more easy to read, but a snake case, uh, you can read it faster, for example. The thing is that you need to choose one and stick to that choice that you do. Variable names should be nouns, function names should be verbs. You should avoid reusing name of common functions or variables. So you know that in a package, uh, you have a function that is called average, you should try to avoid to name your function in the same way. You need to strip for names that are concise and meaningful. I know that is not easy. <laughs> and it is related with this other point that say, agree on one mold to name variable and be consistent on your code base. What does this mean? Let, let's, let me ask you, and please write on the chat, how you will name a variable that will contain the average yield of a crop. Average yield of a crop. How, how will you name uh, a variable that will contain that, that uh, data? <laughs> nice, Nick, Danny. Who else? I want more options. I want more options. Okay, I see a thumb up for Danny option. Who else? Microfield, curve ever. Okay. Ever hear yield of crop? <laughs> As we can see, <laughs> Leah, oh my God, Leah, you are going to give me a heart attack. <laughs> As we can see, it's really hard to, um, be in an agreement on how to name a variable. So one of the things that you and your team need to do is to agree on one mold. For example, we can say, we are going to use the function uh, or the calculation first, then underscore and name the name of the variable we are doing the calculation. So in that case would we'll be, could be like this, ABG, uh, yield or ABG crop yield. The other thing is to say, okay, no, we are going to use the variable name uh, first and then the calculation. And that will be, uh, I'm writing yield underscore ABG, which is correct, both of them. The important thing is that you are consistent through your code. So you always know that you are going to find max, abg, mean, sum first, and then the variable, or that you are always going to find yell first, and then the name of the calculation. Does that make sense? That will help you 
to read your code and the people who will use your code in a more easy way. Okay, what else? These kind of conventions of how to write code are usually in style guides. Each language has one, um, and there is some conventions that are that are kind of similar across languages. In this really tiny picture that I put here, I'm sorry because it's so small, I have two chunk of codes that are exactly the same. It is in R. And I would like to know which one is more easy for you to read in case that you can see it. I'm sorry that it's so, so small. No, I can you zoom it soon or may do a screen? Mm, screen? I don't know how to do that. Or copy, or copy the photo and then put it on the chat, maybe. Okay, okay. Yes, the link is on the um, the okay. link. Yes, the link is on the etherpad that the here is. Okay, I will advance on this idea to, for a matter of time, but the first code I call that is a novel. And the second piece of code, I say that is a poem. And for coding, it is more easy to read a poem than to read a novel. Why? Because this enter and this identification that we have help us to read the code in a more easy way. It's helped to the flow of the code. And these kind of things are in the in these style guides. So for example, you are going to find things like always put a space after a comma, never before. Don't put a space inside or outside parentheses for regular function calls. Place a space before and after an equal. In the case of R, you have the package styler and literal to help you to reinforce these rules. And the tidy verse style guide that give you uh, how you should write on every thin aspect of the code. And for Python, it is the standard Python style guide that you can use. So this is going to help you to write a more clean code and to write like the other people who are writing in that language is doing. So your code is going to see, um, to look like, most of the other code that people are used to. Now, let's, let's go to talk a little bit about testing. That, what, that is the other uh, topic that um, asked me to, to talk about today. So why we should test our, our software? How we can be sure our code produce reliable results? We are doing science after all. So, um, the author of the research software engineer with Python say, well, we can, not completely, but we can test software behavior against our expectation to decide if we are sure enough that our software is doing what we want to do. So we should assume that mistake will happen and we're against them. That is called this defensive programming. We should start to think, okay, how this call could fail. And for that, we have different kind of um, tools. One of the first is an assertion. Assertion is used to catch in errors. We introduce assertion to our code, so it checks itself uh, when the code is running. So for example, for Python, you have the assert statement, and for R, you have the stop if not function. Uh, assertion will check for precondition. For example, I need that this to be true in order to these functions um, can run correctly. A post condition uh, is something that the function guarantee that is true when it's finished. So after I run this piece of code, I need to have this um, outcome, or I need to have this result, or, or I need to have this flag that have this value. And an invariant, it is something that is true for every iteration in a loop. So for example, you are going to run a loop and check that this value is always a minimum, and it, or it is between this threshold, for example. Then you have unit testing um, that 
this the idea of the unit test is to prevent an error with assertion we catch the error when it's happening with unit testing we try to prevent so unit tests check the correctness of a single unit of software for example a function and a unit text typ uh, typically we have a feature which is the thing that we are going to test for example the data that we going to send to our function a result that our function or our code produce when we give that feature and an expected result that we are going to compare with the result we get and with in that comparison we are going to decide if our code is working right or if our code is wor working wrong and and our open site review call, we request packages that have a test suite, so several unit testing, um, preferably unit tests for all function. Um, we are going to request that this test um, are testing the key functionality of the package. Um, we usually try to get a 75% of test coverage of the code. If you don't have that, we are going to try to see if that is okay anyway. Then we need to uh, the integration testing. So with unit testing, you are testing that one functions work fine um, and isolation by themselves. Integration testing check that several functions or several aspects of our code work correctly together. And usually they are structured in the same way in a unit test. Uh, we use a feature that is used to produce a result that is compared with this expected result. But most of the time, um, create a feature for, for integration testing is more complicated because we need to take into account this flow on the, on the code. And for Everything we all see, testing framework are a very useful tool to, that help us to run and manage several unit tests. For R, we have TestDat, and for Python, one of the most used, uh, used uh, testing framework is PyTest. And in the testing chapter of the R OpenSci guide, there are several other packages recommendation in the case that you call in R, um, for testing things like access to database, creating plots, interaction with web resources, um, among other tasks. And the final concept that I want to share with you related with testing is called continuous integration. We are going to be coding, we are going to be testing, um, and we are going to use these frameworks that, that will run this testing locally. And when we share this code with the world, uh, we become an open uh, software, as Leah said to us, we are going to, new, to need to run this test in an automatically way. So whenever someone, as me or other people who are contributing to my software, made a change, we need to run this test. Why? Because uh, this way, we are going to know immediately if that change cause, uh, cause some problem or break something. We can set up to run tests with different configurations of the software, for example, for different um, operating system or for different options in our in our software so this will help us to maintain the quality and the functionality of our software an example of a tool for do continuous integration is github actions for example and in the R open side that guy there is a chapter on best practices for doing continuous integration if you want to learn more so where where to learn more here is the list of all the materials that I already mentioned on the slides. Um, thanks for listening and enjoy coding. Thank you, Yanina. Thank you so much. That was very entertaining, even for someone who doesn't code like me. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that. Um, okay, so questions, people. Any? I'm sure you will have during, I mean, while you code, you want to think, oh, I should have Yanina next to me so I can ask her. <laughs> 
but uh, if you have any now, um, before we go to the breakout rooms, or something in the pad. No? Ah, there's one here. Richard is asking, how can we join your community? Yo, Richard, um, I'm going to share um, a link to the our OpenSci um, web page. There is several ways to, to contribute to the community, but uh, if you first want to kind of take a look, like open the door, see what is going on, what people do. We have a discussion forum where you can ask questions and help people to answer in some uh, other questions that you know about it. You can register to a newsletter. You can volunteer for being a reviewer. You can send your package so we can review. Now the developer guy is in English, but we did the translation to Spanish. So very soon we are going to launch that book. So if any one of you are interested in helping to translate this to other languages, we are going to have a process for that and will be awesome to to uh, that if you want to join. And uh, we also uh, like people who make questions and answer questions or write blog posts. So if there is, a, you are using an our open site packages or you want to use one and you want to share your use case with us or you want to write a blog post for us on how you use it or when, uh, what you learn, please write to me and we are going to be very happy to help you to, to do that too. Um, and I will share other ways to, to contribute. Uh, that is kind of path for being part of our open site that has to do with what you want to do. Uh, so I will share, I will put the link on the um, on the etherpad and I will share on the on the chat. But we have an entire book on how you can <laughs> be part of our uh, community. Thank you for the questions. Any other one? No? Okay. Well, I'm sure that doesn't have to do with the, the talk because I seriously found it very entertaining, even for me. So so thank you, Yannick. Fantastic talk. And um, okay, so we have some breakout rooms. We have time for them. Uh, so here's how the breakout rooms work. They are not recorded and they are going to, we're gonna have to like two or three people per room. Um, so the ones that uh, wanted written will go to the written room and the other ones to the spoken room. Um, so there is a prompt so that the breakout rooms will last 10 minutes. Uh, and there's one that I'm going to, there are two questions for the breakout rooms, but I'm going to only leave you for one. So discuss one question with the other person or the other two people. Uh, what are the benefits of, of becoming an open scientist? This is an idea. You can discuss about this or you can discuss about the presentations as well. It's up to you. But one idea is to talk about the benefits of becoming an open scientist. Um, that's it. So the breakout rooms are ready. Thank you, uh, Laura, for that. And I'll see you. We'll see you in 10 minutes. Sure. I will just open the rooms for people to join. are we what do we do <laughs> if you want you can you can be sent to one um uh, not no it's not obligation but uh if you want laura can send you to one or you can actually join one yourself uh, i think so let me see yeah you could you can open the breaker rooms and the three dots um and the zoom uh screen you can open record rooms and join whichever one you want. You see them? Is there a, is there a difference? Right, Shani, I don't want to, if you had a question too, just. 
Uh, the difference is room one mostly has uh, people who have an S before their names. So they are they prefer spoken, uh, a spoken breakout room. And then room two has people that have Ws before their name. So they prefer written breakout rooms. So in one, you can speak and the other one is just written. Yes. Cool. I'll stay here. <laughs> Me too. Take the time. I'm looking for the links that I promise. Oh, and I'm looking for how do I get into a room? Laura, can yeah, you? I think I, I I think that we don't see the option to join the room for oh, being honest. Okay. I, I I at least I don't have it on ah, the okay. So you, you yeah. both want to uh, join one? I, I will looking for the links before, oh, okay. so yeah. I, I can play with my word <laughs> and, and then I can I can join one. <laughs> I'll send you to the spoken one, uh, Leah. Sounds good. Room. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, good. It worked. Laura, you have such a good, oh, I should stop recording, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, people, you're coming back. Some of you, ah, oh, in five seconds. Um, someone note, uh, put a note in the etherpad. A nice a breakout room, a nice way, a way to have a break, uh, break uh, a nice way to have a backup of your files and a place where colleagues can find your work without having to manage personal migration of your working files. Okay, we need more context for that note, I guess. Um, but, okay, we have everyone now, only 10 people. Why are some other people aren't back? Weird. Anyways, we'll continue people. I have the feeling that some people haven't been back from the break rooms, but in view of the time, we need to quickly continue. Let me know how, how did the break room session went? Um, uh, yes, please go, Leah. Thank you so much. It's already 11.30. So we're going to finish right now. Check the other pad for, for anything, people. Leah, thank you so much again. Um, hope to see you very soon in Slack in other places as well. And yeah, people get in touch with the presenters if you need to. Um, I'm going to be talking to you in Slack about the assignments for this week, okay? Because we need to leave now. But yeah, reach out to everyone if you have the questions. Jani completed the other path with through the links. Thank you, Laura. Amazing voice. Um, I won't be saying anything about a podcast, but <laughs> okay. Okay. Take care. Thank you again. Janina, thank you so much. Olai Tan. And uh... thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Ciao, ciao. Bye, bye. 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 Ciao, Rita. Okay, bye. bye. Yes. All right. Bye. Um, uh, chao, chao, hablamos luego, uh, talk later. <laughs>